Psalm 68 says, Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Sing, lift up a song to him who rides through the desert. His name is the Lord. Exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Our God defends the weak. Our God defends the powerless and the needy. He is a God of the orphans who have no advocate, adopting them in his loving arms, giving them a new identity, a new family, a new hope. He is also a God of widows who have no support system, becoming to them the divine bridegroom and surrounding them with a new family, his church. Well, if God cares so much for the downtrodden, then what does it mean for us as his children? How do we care for one another well in our home? and in our church? Because the answer to this question is aligned with the theme of 1 Timothy, and indeed in the pastoral epistles, that that all of our actions should reflect the good ordering and the stewardship from God that is by faith. Chapter 1, verse 4. In this case, the, the literal financial stewardship from God that is by faith. So let's look this morning at what Paul says about caring well in our domestic household as well as within the divine household of God. And it's really important to understand that this entire passage here is directed toward people inside the church. We're not talking about how to care well for those in the community, for those who Uh, don't know the gospel, for those who have never met our Lord Jesus Christ and called him Savior, there are other passages for that. But this is for how do we care well for our own. Now the context is going to be talking about widows. But obviously the, the larger application is for those who are in need. And we're all needy, aren't we? We're all needy in our hearts. We're all needy in our minds. We all need this teaching. We need to hear this teaching as we lead in God's family. So I'm going to invite you this morning to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 as we're on the tail end now of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Open your Bibles. Open your Bible apps. Let's look at what it means to care well for people in our home as well as caring for people in the church. Both of those this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm going to have you go down all the way to the end of the passage in verse 16 here. Let's begin with the end in mind. Very end of the passage, verse 16. Let the church, Paul says, not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Now here is Paul's conclusion to what's about to come, that that the church would not be unduly burdened, utterly burdened beyond its financial means. Because stewardship, financial stewardship, is also a part of God's good order in creation. And while it's true that we see the early church blossoming and burgeoning in Acts chapter 2, and it says that they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing their proceeds uh, to all as any had need, the needy. Yet this doesn't mean that the church was flush with cash. As a matter of fact, great sacrifices were being made. We think of Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 who was selling his a piece of land and giving it to the apostles for these new converts to Christ. 
And though certainly there were uh, wealthy patrons within the church family in the early church, they probably met in their homes, there were also many in need. Having been ostracized out of the, out of the synagogue, excommunicated from their families, and without means of financial support, the need was great, and therefore Paul makes this plea to Timothy for wisdom and discernment in the care of the needy. Don't put so much burden on the church, he says. And the needy in this case were exemplified, were Ill- he illustrates uh, by talking about widows. Widowhood is such a significant uh, part of Scripture, a theme in Scripture. James, as, uh, um, as Maggie just read, James called our ministry to widows, pure and undefiled religion, visiting them in their affliction. The apostles in Acts chapter 6 deployed specific men to help serve widows so that the apostles could focus on the preaching and the teaching of the word. And as I just read in Psalm 68 at the beginning, that our God himself cares for the widows. And Paul concurs here in this passage, but with one qualification. Did you catch it? Verse, Go back up to verse 3 now. Honor widows who are truly widows. He actually says this three different times in this passage. Chap, uh, verse 3, uh, and then I think in verse 5, and then in verse 16. And he clarifies here what he means in verse 4. He says, uh, honor widows who are truly widows. Here's what I mean. Verse 4. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, that is, she has extended family around her, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Now, let me paraphrase this. If, if mom becomes a widow, if she loses her husband, then the primary task, Paul says, for the extended family is to, and I love the the New America or the New International Version here, the NIV, it says uh, it's for the extended family to put their religion into practice. That's a great translation. To put their religion into practice, in other words, to show godliness by paying mom back for raising them. to give her the financial care and support that she's earned. Because this, he says, is pleasing in God's sight. The only other time he uses this phrase, pleasing in God's sight, is back in chapter 2, verse 3, when he says, I urge that, that the church pray for all people and live godly and dignified lives because this is pleasing. This is a blessing to God when you do this thing. And we'll just have to acknowledge here just for a moment that Western culture, and by Western I include us, of course, we're terrible at this. The aged and the elderly in terms of those in need and needy uh, are just shuffled off into some corner and forgotten. We would do well actually to learn from our uh, from Eastern culture, especially Asian culture, who reveres the aged, reveres the needy, reveres the elderly, because... Uh, though widows are not um, uh, unuseful parts of society or, or people that just need to be shoved into a closet and not heard from again, we would do well as a church, as a culture, to reconsider how do we treat the aged and the needy. Because it's pleasing in God's eyes for the family to come around them and to care for them. And so this is why he says in verse 7, Command these things as well, Timothy, Paul to Timothy. Command these things so that they may be without reproach. Remember, so much of 1 Timothy here is about godly living above what is common, above what is profane, above what is worldly in a way that reflects the truth and the beauty and the goodness of God. And so being above reproach necessarily means that that families... And I'm not talking about the church family, I'm talking about actually just blood relatives taking care of one another. And so therefore, in verse 8, 
he says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It's a pretty strong statement. But Jesus in Matthew 15, uh, verse 4, by way of Exodus, uh, chapter 20 and 21, says, For God commanded, honor your father and mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. So as believers, not taking care of our own parents is akin in this passage to denying the faith. Remember, the faith is a, is a huge theme for Paul here in this. How we walk with God. How we walk with our Lord and Savior. And he says it's the opposite of confessing the faith. It's denying it. Because neglecting this duty is an affront to the glory of God. And so therefore, in verse 16, he acknowledges here, going back to verse 16, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Now I know what you're thinking. Ah, all the men just went... See, that's just for believing women. No, man, you're not off the hook here. This is not his point. I think what he's talking about is in the context of domestic life where, where women, uh, over which women have been given a particular duty uh, and authority and order in the domestic spheres of life, generally, proverbially, proverbially, Paul directs this to believing women, but certainly the broader application is for all of us that have those in need in our family broadly, again, to widows specifically, to anybody in our family that has a real true need. Paul says, you have to take care of them. Didn't say it would be easy. Probably is going to be sacrificial, but it's something that accords with the glory of God, accords with his good order in creation. And so these are the, this is the first group he addresses, is just family members. But then what is true in the domestic household is also true in the divine household of God. We are to care for one another, like family. How many times have you heard me beat this drum since I've been here? We are family. Verses 1 and 2, go back up, where he tells Timothy, Timothy, don't rebuke an older man. But encourage him as you would a what? A father. And then encourage younger men as you would what? Brothers. Older women, encourage them as you would encourage whom? Mothers. Younger women as sisters. In all purity or in, in, in using all propriety. We're family. See, when Jesus proclaimed to his disciples in chapter, uh, John chapter 15, no longer do I call you servants, but I have called you what? Friends. He opens the door to, to courtesy, to respect, to honor, to intimacy between himself and us and his disciples. It's not just rabbi and students. It's friends now. I mean, inv he invites us in to a deeper level of fellowship. And now since the Holy Spirit dwells in each believer, we now live out our faith with one another in this new intimate fellowship as family. So no, friends, we don't just go to church together. We are spiritually bound together as fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers in the faith. In Christ, we honor one another as family. It's the point of the first two verses here. Is that how you view it? Is that how you view us? Is that how you live your lives? Is that where you spend your time? Is that who you're praying for? We honor one another as family. We encourage each other as family, verses one and two. And we care for our family when they have need. 
Again, going back to this idea in verse 3, that she who is truly a widow. And then he goes on to say that this person, this person that has a true need, has been left all alone, has set her hope on God, and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So Paul's point is a true widow, in in contrast to to verse 4, the one who has blood relatives around who can support her. She says a true widow is one who is all alone. She doesn't have a family support network there in place for her. And a true widow is one who has lived in fidelity to God. She has set her hope on God. She has faithfully walked with her Savior. And a true widow is one who is faithfully engaged in the worship life of the church. Now, why do I say that? This is the idea of continuing in supplication and prayer. The actual wording is, has continued in the supplications and the prayers. Kind of indicating not just that this is a woman who is a prayerful woman, that she prays on her own, wherever she's at. That's not really what he's saying. He's saying this is a woman who is engaged in the worship life of the church. The, the prayers and the supplications also used in chapter 2 of, of the whole church that is meant to be praying and supplicating and, and asking God to do things. This is a woman who is engaged faithfully in the ministry life of her church family. And then skipping down to verses 9 and 10, Paul now specifically lays out that a true widow should also be enrolled. That is, the church actually kept a list of people that said these people qualify for financial need. That doesn't seem very, um, I mean, in this day of uh, age of organic, like we should just kind of care for all the people in the church. Paul actually says there's there's an enrolled list for true widows. And so they should be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, This is not prescriptive. This is Paul just saying they're past marrying age or they've decided they no longer want to be married anymore. That's just, that was in this season of life and now it's, it's not now. Okay, so it's not necessarily saying 60 is some magic number because in our day and age, people are getting married at all different kinds of ages. Matter of fact, I know a couple of you. So just saying if they're past uh, deciding to marry, then then they qualify then. And they also then have to be the wife of one husband. It's the actual, or the Greek term, the uh, one man woman. Just like we learned back with elders a couple weeks ago, uh, that they needed to be one women men. These widows are one men, one man women. Let's see if I can say that right. That is, they've been faithful to their covenant not precluding those that have been remarried in a biblical way, not precluding those who are single necessarily, just saying that they've been faithful to whatever uh, season of life that God has entrusted to them. And, that's verse 9, verse 10, they also have a reputation for good works. And then he goes into a list of good works. She's brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the feet of the saints, cared for the afflicted, devoted herself to every good work. And the bookend ideas here, you you should catch this in verse 10, that Paul starts with good works, and then he ends this verse with every good work. The point being, the theme here, is that this is a woman whose godliness in good works has been evident in reputation and in practice. Paul is illustrating what he means. Because the truly needy, broadening this past widows, the truly needy are those who have sacrificed their lives and have considered others more important than themselves by means of child rearing in this case 
Remember, he's already talked about this in chapter 2, verse 15, when he says that she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and in self-control. So this idea is that generally when, when uh, and this can be, by the way, biological or spiritual. This is not precluding again, well, you have to have children or else you can't be considered a widow. He's just saying that they have poured them, that this person or these people have poured themselves in to the next generation. Biologically, spiritually, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But they have continued in faithfulness in that way. And they have also uh, sacrificed through, through opening their homes. They've sacrificed by being servant-hearted. They're foot washers. There's nothing too menial for them to do. They're servant-hearted. They've had compassion on those who are suffering. My mother-in-law was this kind of person. And when her husband left her, and when she just recently passed, as you know, uh, I saw her domestic family rise up. Her children rised up and called her blessed. I saw her church family come to the fore and, and, and prepare and help and surround her, her domestic family with the church's love. And these two things came together because my mother-in-law was a foot washer among foot washers. And she opened her home in hospitality and she gave her life so that others, uh, her kids, and also the next generation of the church would be blessed. This was just the kind of person she was. And I said it last week, and I'll say it again this week, friends, character matters. The way that you live your life, the way that we live our lives, the way that the needy in the church live their lives matters. And so in Christ's family, meeting a financial need, in this case, has qualifications attached to it in the way that people live their lives. Now, I know what you want to say. Oh, it should just be unconditional, right? Like Jesus' love was unconditional. Well, sure it was, but, but Jesus' reputation is also on the line here. When we call ourselves Christians, then our lives need to match up with what he says to be true in his word. And so we as a church must also care for those in the church who have no other means, but who also have godly character. That's what it means. The truly needy. But then the truly needy then is also then contrasted with the undeserving. There's a whole section in here about those who don't deserve the church's Support, starting in verse 6, where he contrasts, but she who is self-indulgent is dead, even while she lives. As opposed to being others-centered, this person is self-centered. They are only interested, she is only interested in uh, taking care of herself in a quite shameful and despicable way. I'll get to that in a second. This is what Paul says about the undeserving. He says, but refuse to enroll younger widows, meaning just they're within the marrying age, they still desire to be married. For when their passions, he says, draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur, incur condemnation for having abandoned the former faith. So the key to understanding what Paul is saying here is understanding this word passions, which sounds uh, like it could be bad, but like we could be passionate too, right? Eh, that's not what this means. This actually means the idea of, of running wild with sensual impulses or being governed by strong physical desires such that it draws a person away from fidelity to Christ. Not a good thing. These passions aren't the good passions. These are self-indulgent, self-serving passions, sensual, sexual passions. And therefore, he says, desiring to marry, 
That's not a good thing. This is a, in a negative connotation here. These younger widows desire so burn for marriage that they compromise their godliness and their integrity to make that happen. I will be married again come hell or high water. Now, I remember being in this setting. By the way, this is not just directed towards widows and women, by the way. Even though this is his specific application, when I was a young single, uh, I became a believer, went to Denton Bible Church, and I was among, well, it was the church of 3,000. So there was a huge community of young singles at the church. And guess what? One out of every like three or four singles, men, women, didn't matter, were kind of this way. Like the desire to marry was so high that everybody was just looking for the, looking for the, um, the, the partner, Right? Oh my gosh, and like everything was directed towards how can I find the right mate? Almost to the point sometimes where people, you'd have to like pull them back and be like, yeah, remember Jesus? So I remember what this, this season is like. And, and so this unhealthy sexual desire then manifests itself in a number of ways here. In verse 13, it says, he says, besides that, They learn to be idlers, going about from house to house. Not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. Now, I've always read this as like, well, they've they've got sensual problems, and then they also are loudmouths. But it's really in the context, these two ideas are very much related. Driven by sensual pleasure, driven by sensual desire, And to be married, this is a widow who has idle hands. And we know what idle hands are. The devil's play toys. They have wayward feet. They go where they shouldn't go. They have syrupy words. Gossip, slanders, all of which look a lot like the Proverbs 7 woman. You all know what I mean, the Proverbs 7 woman? Let me, give you a, let me give you a snapshot here, and you tell me if it sounds like this woman. Proverbs 7, the forbidden woman, the adulteress with her smooth words. She's wily of heart, loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him, come in, my husband's not at home. Sound familiar to this woman right here? 1 Timothy 5. Paul is arguing that that these kinds of people, these types of people, should not be tying up the financial resources of the church. These are the undeserving needy. Their lives are not matching up to their testimonies. They're lining their nests for their own good, not for the good of others. Their hearts aren't right. And they'll say and do whatever it takes to get what they want. And so in this case, in verse 14, he says, I would have younger widows marry and bear children and manage their households and give the adversary no occasion for slander so that Jesus' name would not be besmirched. That there's an order that I bring order out of chaos, that there are things and activities and ways to live that I prescribe in my creation that are good, that reflect my truth and my beauty and my goodness. And so go do the things that accord with righteousness. Because he says in verse 15, some have already strayed after Satan. Now, the only other time he's used Satan's name in this is to describe him. Uh, Himenaeus, I think I'm saying that right, and Alexander. And he says, I've turned them over to Satan so that they would be saved. But these women are actually willingly going after Satan. They're straying after him. These widows, these undeserving, he says, they should pursue the path of righteousness, pursue the orderly way of Christ. Be good citizens of God's kingdom but they should not be supported by the church. Not a popular message for today. Exclusion 
excluding people. Though excluding people inside the family of God, remember. We're not talking about people outside the family. We're talking about people in the family. Friends, why, why does Paul teach this? The gospel of Jesus Christ is amazing. The gospel of Jesus makes all things possible. The gospel recon- it makes it possible to reconcile all people unto himself. And we're, we talk about a free gift of grace that comes from Jesus Christ who bled and died on the cross, who died for our past sin and our present sin and our future sin. And we ask, what must we do to be saved? And Jesus says, all you have to do is accept a free gift. So why, Paul, would we exclude people from supporting them in their, in their need, in their perceived need? Well, friends, because Jesus' grace was free, but it wasn't cheap. Jesus' grace was free, but it wasn't cheap. He bled and died. He suffered a, a, a sinner's death. He suffered a criminal's death, one that was undeserved. He was persecuted and tortured and died at the hands of the Romans so that you and I would be set free. It cost him everything. It cost our God everything. And so, brothers and sisters, we must steward God's resources in the church well. Probably the broadest application possible here. Being a a, a part of the divine household of God means doing our very best to live lives that reflect the goodness and the truth and the beauty of God. And that extends even to how we care for one another and how we care for the needy. It means that we deploy our resources in ways that reflect that truth and that beauty and that worthiness, praiseworthiness of God as well. Caring for one another well means having character for one another. We shall be holy because our God is holy. And this too is essential for all of us as we lead in the divine household. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we acknowledge in the midst of uh, of maybe even a difficult teaching that, that we are all needy and in need of becoming more like Jesus Christ. And so, Father, all we can do is, is set our lives and our hearts up against, up against our Lord, acknowledge our, our, the ways that we've fallen short and sinned against you, and ask for your forgiveness. Father, we pray that you would teach us how to care for one another well within the household of faith. I pray that if there are family members here that are not taking care of of their loved ones and their blood relatives well, that they would do all they can to do what accords with godliness. I pray, Father, if there are those within our church family who have need, that have no other means of support, who are living in such a way that reflects your truth and your beauty, that we would do our best to surround them with love, with care, with resources. Father, that others may see our good order, that they may see the way that we treat one another as family, and they may glorify our Father who is in heaven. We will pray all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.